Welcome back, class, and we are heading into chapter 13 today. I hope uh, this finds you well at the beginning of the recording today and that everything is going well in the class. Chapter 13, which will be our topic of discussion for this particular lecture, deals with the microbe and human interactions and really starts to dive into the field of epidemiology, which is the study of disease and the prevalence of disease in a population. So hopefully today, uh, since we are uh, have experienced several pandemics over the last few years for various diseases, both viral and bacterial, um, a lot of these terms will hopefully seem familiar to you as we begin to dig into the lecture today. So without further ado, let's dive in. It's important to understand that our bodies are not alone. We actually have a significant amount, amount of resident microbes that are living both within and on the surface of our bodies. And these organism, organisms are constantly coming and going and changing in uh, concentration over time. So we actually refer to our bodies as being a dynamic equilibrium where overall, Things are coming to balance, but populations are changing over time. Colonization is what we usually refer to when we talk about uh, pathogens getting into our bodies. And basically, they are finding a weakened niche that allows them to be able to colonize and ultimately grow to cause disease. The normal flora, as they're often referred to, these are the microbes that live within and on the surface of our bodies and provide us some beneficial uh, effects, uh, do several things for us. The microbes provide a protective surface on many of our body tissues, such as our skin. Uh, we actually have microbes that grow and help to balance the pH out on our skin by producing several chemical compounds. Um, microbes are involved in our host defenses and the development of our immune system. And we also know that microbes can invade healthy tissue and ultimately cause disease. So most of the interactions that we have with microbes are beneficial ones. They are working to help support and develop our systems in our body. But in some situations, they are able to invade, colonize, and ultimately cause disease. So a few terms, and you're going to see that a lot of Chapter 13 really focuses on key terminology. We have what's referred to as the normal resident microbiota, or as I've termed them already for you, the normal flora. And these are the microbes that are associated with our body in either a mutualistic, meaning that we receive a benefit and they receive a benefit from us as well, or a commensalistic relationship, meaning that they are uh, growing and residing uh, in our bodies, but we're not really receiving any impact from them being there. An infection, however, is now when a uh, pathogen is able to enter colonize, and evade the host defenses to grow within our tissues. The infectious disease would be the series of symptoms uh, that result due to the fact of the infection and the disruption to our body systems and tissues from that particular pathogen. So there's really three kinds of methods for microbes to have a affinity to our bodies. The first one at the top here is the contact. And the contact is where microbes are exposed to body surfaces. And this could be, as we're gonna see later on, a direct contact, meaning that we touch a surface, or an indirect contact through something like respiratory droplets when someone sneezes. It could be an invasion where microbes are able to evade our host defenses and enter into healthy tissue. It can also be an infection 
where that pathogen now is able to multiply within those tissues. And we're also going to see over here that part of this contact piece, we're also going to see colonization by our normal flora. And we're going to talk about uh, things like the birth process and how we associate some of our normal flora uh, at the early stages of birth and even at a very young point in our lives, we already begin to develop that normal flora. So our internal organs and tissues, for the most part, are microbial free. Most of the outside of our body, however, has both what we call resident flora, which are the microbes that live within and on our bodies all the time. But we also have the transient flora. And the transient flora are those microbes that are acquired and reside with us for a very short period of time. And that may be acquired by touching a doorknob and acquiring some of those microbes on the surface of your hand. Um, it could be from uh, you know, a surface that you contact on a bus, on a train, on an airplane, and some of those microbes are then uh, adhered to your body, but don't normally live there and may not live there once uh, you degerm through something like hand washing. So these are sites of our body that normally have flora associated with them. So as we already mentioned, skin being a big one since that's that outer surface that's constantly contacting the external environment the upper respiratory tract such as your oral cavity and your nasal mucosa the mucosa is that mucus lining uh, that is found within most of our tracts throughout the body like the respiratory tract the gi tract starting with the mouth and we're going to talk about the mouth as well as fecal matter that exits our body actually has extremely high amounts of microbes associated with them. The outer opening of the urethra, the external genitalia, the vagina, the external air and the air canal, and the external eye, places like the eyelids and your eyelashes. So, how do we acquire? our normal flora. So as I mentioned to you already, your flora, uh, with regards to your resident flora, generally stays the same. And there are some slight changes over time, depending on things such as health, your diet, your hygiene. In many cases though, your normal flora benefits you by preventing other microbes that are harmful from growing on our bodies. And we call this an antagonism. So antagonism means that one, uh, one organism, we'll take it as an organism, one organism actually works against another. So our normal flora serves a really key role in that it protects our bodies from the colonization of harmful microbes. We talk a lot about endogenous infections, and endogenous infections are infections that occur when normal flora basically evades a site that was once sterile. So we will get into endogenous infections a little later on in the chapter, but again, to help you remember this, think endo, this EN is like enter. So we have normal flora that is being introduced to a site. These are areas of the body that you would not expect to see, and we'll go on a little bit further in a second. The next slide will talk about some of the fluids that are microbial free, but things like the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the brain, the bones, uh, your sinuses, the internal eye. These are places that we do not want any microbes growing and are considered sterile. Same thing with the body fluids. We don't want microbes in our blood, our cerebral spinal fluid, which coats the brain and the spinal cord, um, our saliva prior to entering the oral cavity. So how do we start to acquire our resident flora? Well, there's a few different ways. Prior to the uh, newborn passing through the birth canal, the uterus and the contents of the uterus are normally sterile. 
However, when the fetal membrane breaks, the infant is exposed to any of the microbes in that surrounding environment. So passage through the birth canal and immediately after birth, so that subsequent handling, that exposure to the environment, you're going to contact and some of those flora are going to be passed on to the baby. Also, breastfeeding is another way that children acquire their uh, basic normal flora as they begin life. So this is table 13.3 in your book. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this provides an overview of the different anatomical regions of the body and many of the different types of microbes that reside, whether they're bacteria, fungi, or protists, that uh, contact that particular site or region. So out of the entire uh, various number of organs and systems in the body, your skin, your integumentary system, is the largest organ of the body. And we've already mentioned that there's two populations. We have our resonance, which are pretty much there all the time with some slight fluctuations. And we have our transients, which can be adhered to from different surfaces and generally do not stay for a long period of time. Um, hygiene can normally remove them. Your flora are going to change on your gastrointestinal tract, so your GI tract, which starts again with the mouth and ends with exit at the anal canal, are going to determine your flora based on the acidity level through pH and also the levels of hormones that are present in that region. The oral cavity, the large intestine, and your rectal area harbor the most flora in this particular region. Your mouth, as we said, the start of that digestive tract, has the most diverse and unique normal flora in the entire body. And that's because there are a ton of different niches or habitats for those microbes. Places like the surface of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, even places like your gums that surround your teeth, uh, the gingiva. Can actually trap a lot of those microbes and that's what we talk about when we talk about you know swollen gums and gingivitis gingivitis is basically an inflammation of those microbes growing on the gum tissue uh, in those places over time the most common residents are the streptococcus species and if you take a look at this bottom stat the bacterial count in your saliva is about five times 10 to the ninth cells per milliliter. If you think about a milliliter and how tiny a milliliter is, in that one milliliter, there is actually about 10 to the nine. So add eight more zeros onto this number. That's the number of bacteria that you can find in a milliliter of saliva. There is a ton of different uh, microbial flora in the mouth. Your large intestine has really complex interactions. There's about 10 to the 8th or between 10 to the 11th microbes in a gram of feces. And since most of your intestinal tract is anaerobic, meaning that there's no oxygen present, you're going to get microbes like bifidobacterium and clostridium growing in this particular region. Your microbes in your large intestine produce a great deal of very useful byproducts. So fermentation of waste materials generates vitamins, things like B12 and vitamin K, and some acids, things like acetic acid and propionic acid. The digestive enzymes that come from bacteria help to break down disaccharides, things like sucrose, into monosaccharides like glucose help in the process of digestion. And depending on the levels of intestinal bacteria present, here's where we get into that whole probiotic piece and the importance of taking probiotics to regulate the levels of microbes 
in your digestive tract, your intestinal bacteria actually do contribute to the intestinal odor that you experience or that other people around you experience. The respiratory tract has uh, some flora. Again, we would not expect any flora down here in the lower respiratory tract, such as the bronchi and the lungs. However, the entrance to your nares, your nasal region here, is going to experience microbes like Staphylococcus aureus. Your mucous membranes are going to experience the Neisseria. And your tonsil, as well as your lower pharynx region, are going to experience Haemophilus. When we talk about the genital urinary tract, we're going to see that females and males differ a little bit in the sites that can harbor the normal flora. Females, we usually find the normal flora in the vaginal tract as well as the outer opening of the urethra. And males, it is the anterior urethra. Any, like we mentioned with the lungs, any of the internal reproductive organs should be sterile. They do not contain any microbes. Same thing as the kidney and the bladder. There should not be any microbes, and that's often achieved by movement of the urine from those regions to keep that sterile environment. Any change in physiology can influence the composition of your normal flora. So the vaginal tract, for instance, in females, is very acidic. However, if that acidity becomes more basic, you can start to see other fungal uh, infections occur, such as yeast infections, that are influenced by that change in pH in the uh, vaginal tract. So we mentioned again, females, the vagina and the outside opening of the urethra. Males harbor their normal flora at the anterior urethra. So how do we maintain our normal flora? Well, obviously, we've already mentioned that this is incredibly beneficial to humans. And anything such as antibiotics, usually when we talk about antibiotics, we're talking about the broad spectrum, the antibiotics that cover multiple microbes, can actually deplete or change the normal flora in a particular body site, and that can ultimately lead to disease. Your probiotics that you take through either supplements or food help to uh, introduce beneficial microbes back into those sites to regulate and maintain that balance to prevent pathogens from growing in those different body sites. So we're going to talk a lot about today, how do microbes get in, known as the portal of entry, and how do they get out? known as the portal of exit. So we're gonna see that there are five major ways that microbes get in. The skin, the GI tract, the respiratory tract, the urogenital tract, and, and through indigenous uh, biota. And they attach through all sorts of different mechanisms. We mentioned the fimbriae, those little hair or bristle-like projections capsules, things like the slime layer uh, and the glycocalyx, surface proteins, and if you're talking about viruses, those viral spikes, and hooks uh, oftentimes on things like the parasitic worms, a lot of the head region, things like the tapeworm on their scolex or head region actually have hooks that they use to attach to host tissues. In order for infection to occur, the pathogen has to be able to survive and evade your host defenses. They have to avoid a process known as phagocytosis. That's basically what we've talked about like Pac-Man. They have to evade being ingested and consumed by your white blood cells. If they get a phagocytosed, they have to be able to avoid getting destroyed. So typically, your phagocytes will ultimately merge with a lysosome, which contains acid, and that lysosome will dump its acid into the phagosome, basically destroying the pathogen. Well, 
microbes have to be able to avoid if they're engulfed being destroyed by that phagocyte. And ultimately, evading actions of the immune system, getting inside of one of your host cells and remaining dormant from the immune system. So what do they do? How do they cause damage? Well, they can cause it directly through things like toxin production or enzymes, or we've talked about with the viruses, lysis, where they break open the host cells. Or indirectly, uh, through the host response. So anytime you have an infection with a pathogen, your body is going to generate an immune response. Immune cells are going to be recruited to the site of the infection. However, even though this response is really targeting the pathogen, oftentimes there will be some damage and destruction to your tissues and cells as well. And we've already mentioned the exit. And I will say that the Portal of entry usually mirrors a portal exit. So the way they come in usually mirrors the way they come out. So table 13.4 talks about several factors that lead to susceptibility, making you more prone to infection. Age is one of the big ones. We talk a lot of times when we hear about infections such as COVID, we saw that the senior citizen, the elderly population, was more at risk. Oftentimes, we see a lot of infections uh, that target very young children, things like whooping cough, genetic defects, surgery or organ transplants, any type of disease such as cancer or HIV are going to weaken body systems and make you immunocompromised. Any type of chemotherapy or certain types of uh, chemotherapeutic drugs are going to weaken the immune system. Physical and mental stress, you know, your sleep, your diet influence your ability to fight off infections. So we're also going to talk about pathogens. And there's two types of pathogens. We have true pathogens, and basically what that means is they can cause disease whether you're healthy or unhealthy. They are going to get in, they're going to avoid and evade your immune defenses and cause disease. Things like influenza, plague, malaria. The opportunistic pathogens, think of opportunistic as opportunity. They are only going to be able to cause disease when your body is weakened, when your immune system is compromised. So things like we mentioned earlier, candida albicans, which is a yeast, that particular microbe is going to evade the vaginal tract and cause yeast infections when the pH of that tract changes. Pseudomonas, folks who are cystic fibrosis patients or burn patients often end up with pseudomonas infections due to uh, weakened parts of the body. We mentioned just a few seconds ago these true pathogens. Well, in order for these true pathogens to cause disease, they're going to use a series of factors known as virulence factors. And these are structures or components that are going to ultimately allow that microbe to get in and cause disease. And we're going to see that these can be secreted factors, these can be enzymes. There's a whole slew of different virulence factors that we will look at as we get into talking about some of the diseases this semester. So we mentioned the portals of entry, the ways that microbes get into the body. And we've got two different agents. We've got the exogenous, so think of exo as exit or outside. Exogenous agents come from a source outside the body, surrounding environment. And we have endogenous agents, or inside, enter. Think of enter as in. These are microbes, as we mentioned earlier, when your normal flora are introduced to a site of your body that is normally sterile. That's what we refer to as an endogenous infection. So we've already mentioned the portals of entry, so I'm not going to go through those again. And this one here takes a look at some of the STIs, uh, a few years ago, they changed from STD to STI. It's actually transmitted infection. 
And the reason why they moved away from the use of the term disease is oftentimes uh, folks, when they acquire a sexually transmitted infection, they often don't present symptoms. They remain asymptomatic. So disease usually carries the connotation that there are a series of signs and symptoms that present. However, if you're asymptomatic, you are not going to present signs and symptoms, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not infected with the infectious agent. So we talk about storch, and storch is a series of infectious diseases that can complicate pregnancies. So these are microbes or diseases that the unborn child can contract during passage through the birth canal. So the S stands for syphilis. The T is toxoplasmosis. The O is actually a composite of other diseases such as hepatitis B, AIDS, and chlamydia. The R is rubella. The C is cytomegalovirus. And the H is herpes simplex virus. Now, in order for a microbe to get in, and cause a disease, it has to fulfill something known as the infectious dose. And for every pathogen that we know of, they have an ID. And that ID is the minimum number of microbes or cells in order for an infection to occur. So I want to say this. This is where it gets a little tricky. If you're looking at numbers, and I give you, let's say, herpes, and I say that herpes has an infectious dose of seven, and I give you influenza, and I say that influenza has an infectious dose of 50,000. Most people think all of a sudden, well, 50,000 is a huge number, so this has to be more infective. That's not the case. The lower the infectious dose, the more virulent or pathogenic the microbe is. So think about that. If you have an infectious dose of one, that means it only takes one cell in your body to cause disease. If it's at 100,000, that means you have to acquire and have 100,000 cells in your body for infectious disease to occur. So here's some different uh, agents, table 13, 6 in your text. Things like measles, look at this, only one virus infectious dose. So this is extremely pathogenic. All the way down to something like cholera, which is acquired through contaminated drinking water, takes 100 million cells. So this is going to be a lot more difficult to cause infection in your body than something like measles or shigellosis. So now that the pathogen has entered, body through a portal of entry, it has to attach to the host. It has to be able to colonize. And we mentioned earlier that that adhesion, that binding to specific molecules between the pathogen and you as the host have to occur through something like the bristle-like projections of your fimbriae, the flagella, that tail-like uh, mechanism that's able to move the bacteria. We mentioned the glycogalyx, that slime coating. Uh, things like the capsule allow for adherence. Cilia. And then we get down to the parasitic worms, which use things like suckers, hooks, and little barbs, almost like little nails that they use to attach. We also mentioned the viruses earlier use their spikes, spikes on the outside of the membrane to attach to the host cell membrane. So table 13.7 walks through a series of microbes and gives you some examples of the different ways that they adhere to host tissues. Now that they've adhered, they've got to be able to survive your host defenses because your body is going to generate an immune response when it recognizes something as not self or foreign. So what do they use to survive your host defenses? Well, we already mentioned that the phagocytes, those white blood cells, are going to come to try to gobble up anything that's foreign. So they're going to produce antiphagocytic factors. They're going to produce leukocytins, which destroy white blood cells. 
the presence of a slime layer or capsule around the outside of the bacteria. Again, here's, here's that capsule layer here surrounding this blue bacterial cell makes it almost impossible for them to be engulfed. And sometimes the bacteria can actually get in and survive with inside the phagocyte. If they are able to evade the host defenses, they're now going to enter through host tissues. And the host tissues, these pathogens are going to use a secretion system to basically insert proteins directly into the host cell. And those proteins are going to help them be able to get pulled within a vacuole inside of the cell. They can also produce these chemical products or toxins that have uh, damaging effects on your tissues and organs. So we often call it a toxemia, which is where the toxin is actually moving through your blood from the initial site of infection. And if you are ingesting, so you eat a food product that's contaminated with toxins, we think about botulism, which is often associated with dented cans. This is what we call an intoxication when we ingest those toxins in a food product or food source. So we've got multiple types of toxins. The major two that we're going to talk about here are the endotoxins and the exotoxins. Again, you've got your EN and EX, your inside, your outside. Endotoxins are not secreted, meaning they're not released from a cell. They are actually part of, we talked about in chapter four, the layers of a gram positive and a gram negative cell envelope. Well, the outer membrane of a gram negative cell, when it breaks apart and is destroyed, that outer membrane actually serves as endotoxin. However, the exotoxin is actually secreted by a living cell. And we often call these AB toxins. The A portion is the portion of the toxin that causes the damaging effect. The B portion is what binds to the host cell to allow the toxin to enter. So endotoxins are part of the cell, that outer membrane of the gram negatives. Exotoxins are actually chemicals that are secreted out of the cell and ultimately go in and damage host cell tissues. So our exotoxins, again, these are the ones that are secreted. You can see your cell hair, and then you see all these toxin molecules being released. They are going to target organs, things like the heart, the muscles, the blood cells, and they're going to cause damage. The endotoxins are actually made up of, you'll see this pink outer membrane here. When the cell dies, this outer membrane actually breaks apart or fragments. And this often has a pyrogenic effect, meaning that a fever is generated. So table 13.8, as you do your review and preparation for exams, this has a really great overview of the differences between exotoxins and endotoxins with regards to how they impact the body uh, and the immune response that's generated as well. We've mentioned the example of the exotoxins, the AB toxins. We've saw already that they are comprised of two components. The B component is the binding component that allows the toxin to adhere to the receptor on the host cell. Once it's uh, accumulated in the vacuole by the host cell, that A portion, the active portion is released, and that's what goes on to attack the cell. So what's the process or stages of infection and disease? Well, at the initial point of exposure to the microbe, we enter into an incubation period. And we're gonna get into all of these in a second, but I just wanna point out to you here, 
We then enter a prodromal phase, followed by a period of invasion where we get the height of the infection, and then our gradual decrease, which is known as the convalescent period. So the incubation period is defined as the time from your initial contact to when you see the first symptom. So the agent is in your body. It is succeeded as the infectious dose where it's able to have enough microbes to cause disease. And it's beginning to uh, create its impact on the cells. Symptoms are not yet apparent, but the microbe is in starting to do damage. The prodromal stage is where you start to get that icky feeling. You're like, oh no, I'm getting sick, here it comes. And it's those vague feelings of discomfort and just this general malaise and weakness and tiredness and just grogginess. Then it's the period of invasion where the microbe is now growing and multiplying at very high levels. The symptoms are intensifying. The infection becomes really well established, and you start to see the typical signs and symptoms. You may have a fever, you may have the aches and the chills, you may sweat, um, you may have a cough or a, uh, you know, a scratchy throat. Finally, the convalescent period is as the infection starts to die off, the symptoms decline, and the person's body begins to respond to the infection. You're creating immune cells that are ultimately destroying the pathogenic agent, allowing the symptoms to de-intensify. So what are the different ways that infections present in our body? Well, we can have a localized infection, something like a boil, where the uh, microbes are located to a very specific region. Systemic means now that the microbe is traveling through the blood and is able to uh, invade other sites or organs throughout the body. A focal infection, on the other hand, is when an infectious agent breaks loose out of this local infection and gets carried to other specific tissues, maybe from the throat and it ends up in the heart and it's impacting the heart. So systemic is more completely spread throughout the body. Focal is it's able to spread, but still maintains kind of one or two organs that it's impacting. Mixed infections or polymicrobial infections are where you may have several infections growing at the same site. So you may have multiple microbes that are all impacting uh, a particular system of the body. Primary infections, just as, as it says there, that's the initial infection. And oftentimes, once the initial infection occurs and it weakens the body, you're often more prone to secondary infections. So for instance, HIV is the primary infection that weakens the immune system and allows for other opportunistic infections, uh, things like uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, to come in and cause more secondary infections and damage. Signs and symptoms. Sign is the objective evidence. So it's something that the, uh, the doctor is going to notice when they examine you. They're gonna see that you have a high fever, your blood pressure is elevated, uh, your skin is pale and clammy. The symptom is your own evidence. It's the subjective information that you're telling the healthcare provider. I don't feel good. My lower back hurts. I'm having uh, a scratchiness when I inhale. So sign is what the healthcare provider is able to detect. Symptom is usually what you feel uh, with your senses. Table 13.9, again, I'm not gonna run through this, gives you some of the different signs and symptoms that are associated with different infections. When we talk about inflammation, some of the earliest symptoms of disease come from your body's defenses mounting. Things like fever, swelling, inflammation is another big one. So with inflammation, oftentimes we see edema, which is this buildup of fluid. 
we see abscesses, which are these collections of microbes surrounded by immune cells. And we also get what's known as lymphodentitis, which is the swollen lymph nodes. When you get infections in your blood, the white blood cells that circulate can change to different levels. So if we have an increase in white blood cells, we call this a leukocytosis. Basically, white leuco is the white blood cell, leukocytes. Cytosis is a generation of cells. Leukopenia is a decrease in the white blood cells. And we've already mentioned septicemia is where the microbes are able to multiply in the blood. And you can have different types of emias. Okay, so emia, anytime you see this suffix here, emia, this implies that it's an infection in the blood. So generally, we call it a septicemia. If it was bacteria in the blood, we would call it a bacteremia. If it was a virus in the blood, we'd call it a viremia. If it was a fungus in the blood, we would call it a fungemia. We've also mentioned asymptomatic infections. These are also sometimes called subclinical. And that's, even though you're infected, you're not experiencing any signs or symptoms. So it's inapparent. You oftentimes won't go seek medical attention because there are no symptoms present. And we've already mentioned the portals of exit. We said that the portals of entry typically mirror, mirror the portals of exit. So the way that a microbe comes in is the way that it will go out. We also have to talk about the persistency of infections. Most infections that we think of are what are called acute, meaning that it's a very rapid onset and it ultimately goes away after a short period of time. We also need to talk about latency. Latency is where you get that initial set of symptoms. So you have the initial infection. And then after a period of time, the microbe goes dormant in the body, basically goes away. It may never come back out, but it's possible that it will relapse. So one of the ones that most people have contacted is chickenpox, the varicella zoster virus. You get chickenpox at a very young age. That acute initial infection goes away. However, the virus remains dormant in the nerve ganglia in your body. And at some point, due to stress, due to diet, the microbe can reemerge at the surface of the skin and present as a disease known as shingles. The same thing with herpes simplex, people who have cold sores on their mouths. Those cold sores can emerge, they go away, the virus remains dormant in the body, and then they can reemerge again at a later time. A chronic infection is one that um, the infectious agent can continue to be shed over long periods of time. And because of these long-term infections, we can get what are known as sequelae. And this is basically permanent sustained damage to tissues or organs. So epidemiology is the study of how diseases are prevalent in a population. And we often look at not only the source, so the individual and the object where a disease came from, but we also talk about the reservoir. Where do we find this particular organism in the natural world? Does it come from a mammalian carrier? Or does it come from an inanimate source like soil or water? Carriers can be broken down further. We can have what's known as a asymptomatic carrier, where they present no symptoms, but are able to spread a pathogen to others. And we also have what's known as a passive carrier, so healthcare workers typically rotate during their rounds from patient to patient. And if not careful, they can actually carry an infectious agent from one patient to another. So that's why the use of PPE, gloves, gowns, masks are important. And changing of those gloves, gowns, and masks in accompaniment of hand washing 
are important when moving from one patient to the next. Incubation carriers, these are folks that can spread the infectious agent during that incubation period. As the microbe is beginning to grow and start to multiply, there are certain diseases where that microbe can be spread. Convalescent carriers are those who are recuperating without symptoms. And chronic carriers, anytime we see chronic, that just means that they're sheltering the agent for a long period of time. We mentioned that animals can serve not only as reservoirs, but as sources as well. And we talk about vectors. So this is a live animal that's able to transmit from one host to another. The majority of vectors are insects or arthropods, things like fleas and mosquitoes and ticks. But some larger mammals, like birds, can also spread infections as a vector as well. We break this down further into two types of vectors. We have biological vectors and mechanical vectors. Biological vectors occur as part of the pathogen's life cycle. So basically, as um, plasmodium, we'll take malaria for instance, as plasmodium multiplies within hosts, it actually is able to survive uh, within the vector. Mechanical vectors are actually carried on the body without being uh, part of that particular organism. So for instance, when we talk about a mechanical vector, we often talk about summertime and you're outside for a picnic and all the food set up outside and you'll notice the one thing that's buzzing around are the flies. Well, flies are attracted to fecal matter. And when they land in fecal matter, they actually carry some of the microbes from the fecal matter on the surface of their feet. And ultimately, when they land on food, some of that fecal matter is deposited from their feet onto the surface of the food. And that would be an example of that mechanical vector. So it's not part of the life cycle, but ultimately the uh, vector transports the infectious agent from one place to another. We also have zoonosis. Whenever we talk about a zoonosis, this means that it's acquired from an animal. So think of zoo, zoo, zoonosis. Those are infectious agents that come from animals. There's about 150 that exist worldwide right now. So table 1310 walks through some of these zoonotic infections. We see things like rabies, which are acquired from animal bites. Uh, we have a lot of um, fevers that come from mosquitoes, things like yellow fever, viral fevers that cause those encephalitis. Influenza uh, has a animal reservoir of a chicken or swine. We can also talk about diseases in terms of how they're transmitted. So we have communicable and non-communicable. So communicable disease is where the host that has the infection can transmit to another host and that infection is established in the healthy host. So we would say that a highly communicable disease is contagious. It's able to be spread easily. Non-communicable diseases do not get transmitted from host to host. So these patterns of transmission establish themselves. We have direct contact, which is actual physical contact. You shake someone's hand, uh, you kiss somebody. Um, indirect contact passes from an infected host to some type of an intermediary and then to another host such as what we would know as vehicle transmission, where the uh, conveyor is inanimate material, such as a doorknob or a toilet seat, food, water, fomites, which are inanimate objects, airborne, could be droplet nuclei, sneezing, coughing, those aerosols are indirect contact. 
travels through the air before it contacts you as the new host. Uh, this particular slide image from your text does a really nice job at walking through direct transmission, such as contact, you mentioned kissing, sexual intercourse, respiratory, um, vertical transmission, which could be from mom to child, the biological vector, we already mentioned that the infectious agent is part of the vector, so like a mosquito, malaria we mentioned, as the mosquito takes a blood meal from you and it bites you, it injects from its salivary glands whatever is contained. So some of that microbial agent, that malaria, is injected into your body during the blood meal. We also have the indirect transmission, things like fulmites, those inanimate objects like doorknobs, uh, food and water, that uh, contamination. So what do epidemiologists do? Well, our main epidemiological organization is the CDC in the United States, and they are really tracking the prevalence and occurrence of reportable diseases across the globe. And they share that information out in a publication called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that describes the levels of mortality and morbidity as well as transmission rates for infections. So when we talk about frequency of cases, this is a lot of the information that the CDC is gonna present. Prevalence is the total number of existing cases. Incidence is the number of new cases. Mortality rate, mortality is the number of deaths. Morbidity is the number of people that are infected or impacted. We can also look at patterns, and hopefully these terms now you are really familiar with after the whole COVID-19 pandemic, but we have endemic diseases, and these are diseases that are relatively steady over a period of time. So we get a pretty consistent uh, outbreak of infections in a region of the uh, country over a, populate, or over a period of time. Sporadic occurrences, again, sporadic meaning they pop up in kind of random locations at very low uh, intensities. Epidemic is basically where you start to get an increasing level of infection or prevalence. And any time that epidemic spreads from one place to another, we call that a pandemic. So that's an epidemic across continents what we're seeing now with the COVID-19. Outbreaks are much more small scale epidemics and they're in much more focused areas. So we've got three different types of epidemics. We've got what's known as point source and that's where the infectious agents from a single source. Common source is that all the cases are from the same source and a propagated epidemic is basically one that increases over time, showing that it's being communicated or it's transmissible from person to person. The nosocomial infections are important because we'll talk a lot about those throughout the semester. These are opportunistic infections, meaning that they take advantage of the body when it's weakened. Nosocomial infections are also known as healthcare acquired infections or HAIs. And these are ones that result from a prolonged hospital stay. They could be respiratory infections. They can be from surgical procedures that may have had some contamination. They may be from uh, contaminated medical equipment such as catheters. These are some of the largest cases of prolonged hospital stays that we know of because of these kind of secondary infections acquired from being in the hospital. So we talk about some of the most common ones are surgical incisions. We talk a lot about the respiratory tract, the GI tract, the urinary tract. Uh, and there's about two to four million cases per year in the US with about 90,000 deaths. So this is extremely prevalent 
and it shows you kind of a breakdown here of all of the different percentages your respiratory tract and your surgical incisions or wounds make up almost half of the nosocomial infections that we know of. I'm not going to go through 1311. This is, uh, and I, I'm not going to test you on this. This is more of uh, FYI. These are isolation methods that are used to prevent nosocomial infections in the clinical settings. But the biggest one are the universal precautions. And the universal precautions are these really stringent methods that prevent the spread of nosocomial infections. So gloves, gowns, masks that we mentioned earlier. I also want to mention too, another thing that um, comes up from our earlier slides. So I'm going to actually go back and just uh, pull up our slides from early on today as we talk about the pathogens and we talk about the passage through the birth canal we often talk about exposing children to their environment at an early age to build some of that immunity and we um we actually refer to this as the hygiene hypothesis and basically what that means is over time you if you're contacting microbes it is going to help develop some of the immunity that you need to be healthy and folks who often are not exposed to these microbes at young ages will develop things like allergies later on because the body doesn't know how to respond to them i wanted to make sure that i addressed that as well today during our presentation so i wish everybody a great week I look forward to seeing you soon in office hours. Please reach out if you have any questions.